Come on. There we go. All right. There is a prescript at the beginning of Bloom Ability that is a quote from a famous um, author named Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it is from a book called Nature. And it says, I become a transparent eyeball. Chapter one, first life. In my first life, I lived with my mother and my older brother and sister, Crick and Stella, and with my father when he wasn't on the road. My father was a trucker or sometimes a mechanic or a picker, a plucker or a painter. He called himself a jack of all trades. Jack was his real name. But sometimes there weren't any trade trades in whatever town we were living in. So off he would go in search of a job somewhere else. My mother would start pick, packing and we'd wait for a phone call from him that would tell us that it was time to join him. He would always say, I found us a great place. Wait till you see it. Each time we moved, we had fewer boxes, not more. My mother said, do you really need all of those things, Denny? They're just things. Just leave them behind. By the time I was 12, we'd followed my father from Kentucky to Virginia to North Carolina to Tennessee to Ohio to Indiana to Wisconsin to Oklahoma to Oregon to Texas to California to New Mexico. And by that time, my, th my things fit in one box. Sometimes we lived in the middle of a noisy city, but most of the time, Dad had found us a tilted house on a forgotten road near a forgotten town. My mother had been a city girl and my father a country boy. And as far as I could tell, my mother spent most of her time trying to forget that she'd been a city girl. Those few times that we lived in the middle of a city, though, she seemed as if she were right at home, in her real home, her permanent home. She'd get a job in an office or a design studio instead of a diner. She knew how to use buses and weave in and out of crowds, and she didn't seem to hear the horns and the sirens and the jackhammers. Those things drove my father crazy. I know there's work here, he'd say, but there's too many bodies and cars everywhere. You're like to get killed just stepping into the road. There's no place to raise kids. My mother would be real quiet after he'd said something like this, and pretty soon he'd be off looking for a better place to live, and she'd be packing again. My sister Stella had a theory that dad was keeping us on the move so that my mother's family wouldn't find us. He didn't trust a single one of her brothers or sisters, and he didn't trust her parents either. He thought they had heirs and would talk my mother into moving back to New York, where she'd come from. He said they looked down on their noses at us. Once, when I was seven or eight, and we were living in Wisconsin, or no, maybe it was Oklahoma. It could have been Arkansas. I forgot about Arkansas. We lived there for six months, I believe. A thin woman with gray hair pulled back in a tight bun was sitting in our kitchen one day when I came home from school. Before I could shake off my coat, she'd wrapped me in a perfumed hug and called me Carissima, her sweet kitten. I'm not a kitten, I said, sliding out the door. Crick was throwing a basketball at an invisible hoop. There's a lady in there, I said. Crick aimed and shot that ball into a graceful high arc and watched it bounce off the edge of the garage door. Crud, he said. That ain't no lady. That's your grandma, Fiorelli. There was a big argument that night after I'd gone to bed behind the drapes, hung between the kitchen and the side room. My dad was gone. He'd taken one look at our lady grandma and then bolted out the door, never even pausing to say hello. It was mom and grandma in the kitchen. Mom was telling her how resourceful dad was and how he could do anything and what a rich life we had. From the bed next to mine, Stella said, mom's a dreamer. And in the kitchen, grandma said, rich, this is a rich life. My mother charged on. Money isn't everything, mom, she said. And why you go and let him name that boy Crick? What kind of name is that? It sounds like he was raised in a barn. My parents had an, an agreement. Dad got to name any boys that they had. And mom got to name the girls. Dad told me he'd named Crick after a little clear creek that ran beside the house they'd lived in at the time. Once, when I used the word Crick in a paper for school, the teacher crossed it out and wrote Creek above it. She said Crick wasn't a real word. I didn't tell dad that or Crick either. My mom named her first girl, my sister, Stella Maria. And then I came along and she must have been saving up for me. Because she named me Dominica Santalina Dune. My name means Sunday Southernwood River. Attention staff.
In the staff room is a morning treat. Staff in the, <laughs> there's a treat in the staff room. Thank you. My name means Sunday Southern Wood River. I was born on a Sunday, which makes me blessed, Mom said. And at the time, we lived in the South besides woods and a river. My name is pronounced the Italian way, Domenica Santalina Dune. It's a mouthful, so most people just call me Dinny. In the kitchen, Grandma Fiorelli was steaming on. You ought to think of yourself, she said. You ought to think of those children. They could be in a school like the one your sister works in. Your husband needs a real job. He has a real job. Every six months, basta, Grandma said. Why he can't keep a job for more than six months at a time? What does he do anyway? Why he didn't go to college to get a real job? How are you ever going to get out of this mess? He's looking for the right opportunity, my mother said. He could do anything, anything at all. He just needs a break. Grandma's voice got louder every time she started up again. She was bellowing like a bull by this time. A break? A ridiculo. How is he going to get a break if he doesn't even have a college education? Answer me that. Everybody doesn't need a college education, my mother said. When we come to this country, your father and I, we know not a word of English, but you kids got a college education. Stella threw a pillow at me. Don't listen, Dinny, she said. Put your head under this and go to sleep. The pillow didn't drown out Grandma Fiorelli, though. She barreled on. And what about you, Grandma said to my mother. There you are, a perfectly well-trained artist. I bet you don't even have a paintbrush to your name. I paint, my mother said. Like what? Walls falling down? Peeling walls? Basta. You ought to talk to your sister. The next morning, Grandma Fiorelli was gone, and so was Dad. He'd gone looking for a new place to live. He'd heard of an opportunity, he said. And so we followed him around from opportunity to opportunity. And as we went, Crick got mo into more and more trouble. Crick said it wasn't his fault that every place he went, he met up with people who made him do bad things. According to Crick, some boys in Oklahoma made him throw rocks at school windows. Some boys in Oregon made him slash a tire. And some boys in Texas made him smoke a joint. And some boys in California made him burn down a barn. And some boys in New Mexico made him steal a car. Every time we moved, Dad told him, you can start over. And with each move, Stella got quieter and quieter. Within a week of our reaching a new town, there'd be boys pounding on the door day and night wanting to see her. All kinds of boys. Tough ones, quiet ones, nerdy ones, cool ones. In California, when she was 16, she came home one Sunday night after having gone, been gone all weekend with one of her girlfriends, supposedly, and she said she'd gotten married. No, you didn't, Dad said. Okay, I didn't she said, and then went up to bed. She told me she'd married a Marine, and she showed me a marriage certificate. The Marine was going overseas. Stella started eating and eating and eating. She got rounder and rounder and rounder. And when we were in that hill town in New Mexico, she woke me up in one night and said, get mom, get her real quick. Stella was having a baby. Dad was on the road. Crick was in jail. Stella was having a baby. And that was the last week of my first life. Chapter two, the dot, the dreams of Dominica Santalina Dune. My mother bundled me up in a brown cardboard box and taped it all around and gave it to the strangers. I rumbled along and then I was at the bottom of an airplane next to another box, which barked. There was a dog biscuit in the bottom of my box. And when I got hungry, I ate it. My second life began when I was kidnapped by two complete strangers. My mother, who assisted in this kidnapping, said I was exaggerating. The strangers weren't complete strangers. I'd met them twice before. They were my mother's sister and her husband, Aunt Sandy and Uncle Max. They'd swooped down on our little New Mexico hill town and stayed up all night talking to my mother. In the morning, we all went to see Stella and her baby boy, and then my aunt and uncle forced me into their car. Okay, they didn't completely force me, but no one asked my opinion about this kidnapping. And with me was my box of things, and we drove to the airport in Albuquerque. I was still pretty much in, a, in bubble mode. It seemed that all around me was a smooth bubble, clear enough to see through, but strong enough to keep me inside. It was like a huge, transparent beach ball. I imagined pores in this bubble ball that could let, let in streams of things from the outside, so I could imagine them and then poke them back out again if I didn't like them. On the car trip to Albuquerque, the pores were closed, sealed off. And when I got to the airport, though, I couldn't help it. A few of those pores opened up on their own. Defiant little pores. I'd never been on a plane. 
Uncle Max gave my box of things to a woman in a uniform. Aunt Sandy bought me M&Ms and an illustrated book of fairy tales. I was much too old for fairy tales and told her so, but she said, I'll let you in on a secret. I read them all the time and I'm ancient. We sat in a room and then we got in line and walked down a tunnel and sat in narrow seats. And this was the airplane. When the plane started speeding down the runway, I closed up my bubble tight, ready for the crash. I knew that plane wasn't going to go up in the air like it was supposed to. And I bent over and held my knees in crash position, which is what the little card in the seat pocket told me to do. Aunt Sandy patted my back. We're going to die, I said. The noise was awful, a huge bellowing, whooshing and roaring. And all that time, Aunt Sandy patted my back as if she didn't care if I got all smushed up in a crash or not. Then the front of the plane pointed up and the whole thing, people and all, lifted up and we were flying. Flying. My nose was against the window the whole way, all across the country. I was up in the sky and we went right through the clouds. And sometimes we could see puffy white blankets of clouds below us. Sometimes there were no clouds and we could see mountains and rivers and lakes and roads. In one blink, there were whole towns and then zip, they were gone. And there was desert and more mountains and hills and flat land. There was green land and brown land. It was a miracle. It wasn't anything like driving where you only see this little bit and that little bit, a house, a tree, a gas station, more houses, more trees, fields. In a car, it all starts to run together and you could be anywhere or nowhere. In the plain, you saw it all spread out beneath you, a living map a wide, wide living photograph, and you were suspended above it, and you knew where you were. You were a dot, miles and miles and miles above the state of Oklahoma, where you'd once lived on a speck of dirt, and you were a dot above the state of Arkansas, where you'd even forgotten that you'd lived, and then you were a dot above Tennessee and Virginia. You little dot, or rather me, Dinny the dot. The plane came down again without crashing, and we went to Aunt Sandy and Uncle Max's house in Washington, D.C., where there were two bathrooms that worked, and there were clean carpet and white walls with paintings and frames. My father, who'd been away on an opportunity when I'd been kidnapped, called and cried on the phone and wished me luck in my opportunity. I didn't like to hear him cry, and I didn't want the op an opportunity, but Aunt Sandy and Uncle Max seemed very excited, and so I felt I should do what they told me to do until I could plan my escape. I felt as if this were happening to someone else. It was happening to that Dominica Santolina Dune person, but I was Dinny in my bubble, and I was just watching, planning Dominica's escape. The next day, that Dominica Santolina Dune person got her picture taken and applied for a passport. Two weeks later, we were in the airport again. This time, we flew into the night and over the ocean, and in the middle of the night, suspended over the ocean, the sun came up. Zip! and it was morning before the night was even over. We ate real food, not dog biscuits. The plane swooped over jagged snow-covered mountains and landed without crashing in Zurich, Switzerland, a foreign country. Uncle Max was going to be the new headmaster of a school in Lugano in the south of Switzerland, and Aunt Sandy was going to teach there, and Dominica Santolina Dune was going to live with them and go to their school. Dominica Santolina Dune in Switzerland. It was an opportunity. Chapter three, an opportunity. In the train station in Zurich, people rushed this way, that way, a herd of confused animals. Trains lined up side by side like a row of cattle cars, and people climbed in, climbed out. We stood under the departure board. Platform four, Aunt Sandy said, and she looked like my mother, but she was all dressed up in clothes that matched. She sounded like my mother too, but her words came out faster than my mom's did. Way down there, at the end, run. Are you sure? Uncle Max asked. He was very tall with black curly hair and didn't look at all like my father. He looked like someone in an advertisement, clean and neat, even after our long flight. I was we wearing the remains of my dinner on my shirt. That's the one, Uncle Max said. It stops in Lugano. Aunt Sandy waved at the board, which listed the stops. Right there, see? Zug, Arth, Goldau, Belizona, Lugano. Uncle Max hurried down the gray platform, pushing a cart with our suitcases and my box on it. Dinny, he called behind me, don't lose us. They, they bought me new clothes and new black shoes, which hurt my feet. But I pretended that the shoes didn't hurt because they were new and they'd cost a lot of money. These shoes had a mind of their own, though. 
They kept clunking into each other, making me trip. And I had to stare down at them in order to make them point in the right direction. I felt as if I was trying to keep two little kids from squabbling with each other. All around us, people rushed, calling to each other in German, French, and Italian. Mostly it sounded like Ochtenspit and Flickenspit and Nespa, Sispa, and Mumble Mumble, Giantino, Mumbleino. And then I realized that I recognized some of the Italian words. Ciao, arrivederci, andiamo. My mother said these words sometimes. I wanted to stop and to listen to what everybody was saying. It was as if they were speaking in code and I needed to wait to get all the clues. Maybe they were saying fire, fire, or run for your lives. Dinny, Aunt Sandy called, hurry. I didn't have to go. I could fade into the crowd, be pushed along through the tunnel into the city. I could roll along in my bubble ball. I was used to moving, used to packing up and following along like a robot, but I was tired of it. I wanted to stop moving and I wanted to be somewhere and stay somewhere. And I wanted my family. In New Mexico, I'd heard my mother tell Aunt Sandy, Dinny will be fine, just fine. She's very adaptable. As I stood there in that busy Zur Zurich train station, I was sorry I was so adaptable. And I promised myself that I was going to stop being adaptable right now. But it's hard to change your character overnight, though. Dinny, Dinny, Aunt Sandy called. A small brown bird darted back and forth under the dome ceiling. At the far end of the station, near the high ceiling, was an open window. There, I urged the bird, go over there. Dinny, Uncle Max heaved the luggage up onto the train and Aunt Sandy, now standing in the carriage, pulled it into the aisle. I, little adaptable robot Dinny, followed Uncle Max aboard the, and the station master closed the door behind us. A whistle blew. The clock on the platform clicked as the train station slipped away from the station. And I slid into a seat opposite my aunt and uncle. Oh, Denny, Aunt Sandy said, we made it. And she pressed her face to the window. Look at it. Just look. Oh, Switzerland. Click, click, whoosh. The train rushed out of the city, around the edge of a lake, through a deep green valley, and then up, up, up into the mountains, through dark tunnels, up, 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 crisscrossing the mountain, and then down, down, down. Whish. Oh, I can hardly stand it, Aunt Sandy said. Look at this. Uncle Max pressed his hand against hers. Steep stone cliffs and high green pastures whizzed past the train as it curved through the mountains. Rushing waterfalls came into view and then vanished. Clear rivers raced beside the train, looping and curving along the tracks. Little houses looked as if they were stuck in the side of the mountains, planted there, blooming up out of the ground. Aunt Sandy called these little houses chalets. It was such a smooth word, chalet. I said it over and over in my mind. Chalet, chalet. In fact, it made me sleepy. The Dreams of Dominica Santalina Dune. I was in a box, swaying from side to side. The box was labeled robot and was on wheels, and it rushed down tracks, which turned into a dinosaur's spine and then into a river. Through the Alps, the train rushed, as if on a mission, urgent and efficient. Maybe they were really taking me to a prison where I'd be chained up and fed moldy bread and brown water. I started wondering if I could get used to moldy bread. I could even see myself nibbling at it, trying to keep my strength up, a nibble of the bread, a sip of brown water. I could adjust to that. And then I thought, no, I won't adjust. I won't adapt. I won't. I'll rebel. On the train, we passed a man with two children fishing in a mountain stream, and I had a rolling pang of homesickness. My father had taught me how to fish, and often we'd sit on riverbanks, casting our lines into the water, sitting there quietly, hardly ever saying a word. He loved being outside. You could just see it on his face, a big grin as soon as we'd head off, a wider one when we'd reach the river, the loud sighs as we'd sit there staring at the stream. And when we'd get home, my mother would always say, did you catch anything? Sometimes we caught a few fish, but mostly we hadn't. And at those times, my father would say, we caught the sun, we caught the day. And my mother loved that. She loved it to pieces. She'd kiss his cheek and say, you are a prince among men. In the train rolling through Switzerland, I slept and woke, slept and woke as it all raced by. Three hours later, the train rolled through gentler valleys and pulled into a hillside platform, 
Lugano, the announcer called. Lugano. We were deep in the foothills of the Alps, Uncle Max said, in the southern base of Switzerland. We stepped out onto the platform. Across the street and down below, the city of Lugano curled around a lake. Two mountains towered over the city, and their shadows fell across the water. The mountains stood dark against the sky, like giant guards. No sign of a prison yet. We climbed into a taxi, which wound its way out of Lugano and up a rolling hill between the mountains and onto the Colina d'Oro, which meant the Hill of Gold, Uncle Max said. But it wasn't gold. The hill was green and brown. The road was gray. Around the narrow bends, the taxi raced, and Uncle Max called, There! That's it! Near the road was a sign, and off to the left, tucked into the rim of trees, stood an old red-roofed villa. From the outside, the villa looked dignified and sturdy and vast and frightening. Pale stone walls, iron balconies, tall black rim windows. It looked like a picture in the book Sandy and Max had given me. In that book, a princess was locked in the tower in the villa. Inside were dark wooden floors and dim, narrow hallways. Doors and shutters creaked and groaned. Dusty portraits lined the halls. Grim-faced men in black robes stared directly, accusingly at me, and some faced sideways, ignoring me. In the dining hall, ancient armor and weapons splattered the walls, shields and spears and helmets, ghastly dark shapes. I listened for sounds of a captive princess. This is the place that Mrs. Sterling had chosen to set up as an American school for students all over the world. This is the place where I'd go to school. I wouldn't be alone like the boarding students would be, Uncle Max said. I'd be living with him and Aunt Sandy. I still thought they might be luring me to a prison, and I still didn't understand why I was here. Why I couldn't be with my mother and father and Crick and Stella and the new baby. I thought it was because I'd done something wrong, and this was my punishment. Or maybe they had to make room for the new baby, and one of us had to go. Me. We crossed a courtyard and climbed a hill. We'll get the luggage later, Uncle Max said. I should have had the taxi drop us off at the top of the hill. And we climbed steep stone steps, winding through trees, some with strange orange fruit and others with yellow flowers that smelled sweet like jam. We reached the Via Poporino, a narrow paved lane, and passed a yellow house, a gray one, a pink one, and then stopped in front of a white one with a red roof, a chalet. Oh, Max, Aunt Sandy cried. I am in paradise. Uncle Max fished the keys from his pocket. It was cool and dark in the narrow entryway, red tiled floors, white stucco walls. We have gone to heaven, Aunt Sandy said. Look at this. We followed her into a wide open room with a high beamed ceiling. The far wall was a bank of windows and glass doors. And we followed her through the glass doors and out onto a balcony. Have you ever in your whole life, she said, have you ever seen? And across the valley was the lake. That evening, pale lights shone all the way down the hillside and crisscrossed the mountain opposite, like a string of Christmas lights. A single red light blinked at the top. Aunt, the valley, Aunt Sandy said. The lake, the mountains. What do you think, Denny? Uncle Max asked. Isn't it great? Don't you think it's great? I thought about the hilltop village in New Mexico, and I thought about Stella's new baby coming home. It would all be new to him. I stared across the mountain, huge and dark and vast. Sure, I said, it's great, but I didn't mean it. Later, I'd be able to look at this view and to see it and appreciate it, and it would affect me profoundly. But on that first day, I could only see what wasn't there, my family. Chapter four, huh? Yeah, please stop. The two prisoners. I had walked up to the Colina d'Oro in the village of Montanola and was coming down the back way on a path that led from the village at the top of the hill and wound down past the headmaster's house. It was Aunt Sandy and Uncle Max's house now, and they called it their casa. Wait, not a chalet? I asked. Well, it is a chalet. That's the style, Aunt Sandy said. But the Italian word for house is casa. So this is our house, our casa. They'd been trying to teach me bits of Italian because that's what the local people spoke. Your chalet casa, I said. Ours, she said, our chalet casa. I was all mixed up about where I was. Uncle Max had told me we were in the Ticino, and in the Ticino, people spoke Italian. In other parts of Switzerland, he said, people spoke German or French or Romanish. Wait, but I thought we were in Lugano, I said. 
Lugano's down there, he said, pointing to the city below, and the village of Montanola's up there behind us. So where are we? I asked. He shrugged. In a casa on the Via Poperino between Lugano and Molta Montanola, in the Ticino in Switzerland, in Europe, on the planet Earth. Oh, I said. I put up a sign in my bedroom window that said, kidnapped, held against my will. But Aunt Sandy said, um, people might, might not be able to read that in English. And she brought me an English-Italian dictionary. On my way down the path from Montanola, I was thinking about the two prisoners. It was a story that a boy, Guthrie, had told me the day before. There were two prisoners in a jail cell. They each looked out the same small window. One prisoner said, man, oh man, that's a lot of dirt. And the other said, man, oh man, what a lot of sky. Wait, that's it? I said when Guthrie finished. That's all there is to the story? Just think about it, Guthrie said. So I had been thinking about it and thinking about it some more. Beneath my feet was a crumbling stone path splattered with rotten persimmons. Pieces of the orange fruit were stuck to my new shoes. Wasps dived in and out of the fruit, and a lizard darted along the edge of an old stone wall. What did the lizard see? Could he see only the path and the rotting persimmons and the wasps? And then I looked up, like the second prisoner must have done. Ahead were palm trees lining the path. A blue sky with puffs of white clouds and hills rolling toward the blue lake. Switzerland curled along one shore, and Italy sprawled on the other. Mountains rimmed most of the lake, with the two taller ones standing on opposite shores. Shh. Jeez. On, shh. on top of Mount San Salvatore, the red light blinked. And on top of Mount Bray, a ragged peak dipping into a shallow bowl. Guthrie had said that by October there would be snow on the top of Mount Bray. This seemed weird that I would be standing in Switzerland and see Italy. And it was weird that palm trees and snow could be in the same scene. And it seemed weird that I was even in that scene at all. If I closed my eyes, maybe I would feel as if I were in New Mexico. It definitely didn't smell like New Mexico, and the air didn't feel the same either. But still, if I kept my eyes closed long enough, though, maybe I could change it to New Mexico. Then I could look out the window in, of our house and see my mother and father and Stella and the new baby. If they saw me, though, they might be mad that I'd come back. When a persimmon fell on my head, interrupting my dream, I yelled at it and at the tree overhead and the wasp that zoomed in on my hair. Hey, the lizard skittered up the wall as if he knew where he was going. He had a mission. Could he see the sky? Did I have a mission? Mm -hmm. If I were in prison and I looked out the window, would I see dirt or sky? I didn't understand what I was supposed to see. And it seemed like part of Guthrie's story was about, about the prisoners was missing. There was still a week before school opened. Guthrie had said that he was dropping off his luggage and then going to stay with friends in Milan until then. It would be Guthrie's second year at the school. I thought he was older than I was, but he said he was 13, just like me. You're going by yourself to Milan? I had asked. Oh, it's not far. Heck, you could probably see it from the top of, Mount, of San, San Salvatore Lake. Milano, and he kissed his fingers and raised his hand to the sky, a gesture that seemed odd, foreign, and that it made him seem kind of worldly. And I copied the gesture, and he smiled. Well, how do you get there? I asked. Oh, you just get on the train and off you go. Presto. There in no time. You should try it. Come with me if you want. Guthrie might as well have suggested that I pack up and make my way to Africa. I was having enough trouble dealing with the small patch of Switzerland I was on, which I had been planted. In the week since I'd arrived, I'd explored areas around Max and Uncle Sandy's house in small chunks. I circled the campus on the first day. On the second, I walked the length of the Via Poperino and today, I'd gone all the way up to the Colina d'Oro, to the village of Montanola, and was coming home, the back way, along the path. Tomorrow, I was going down the hill to the church of St. Abendio. I was like a cat, scoping out my territory. This was something I did automatically, every place I lived. Guthrie had asked where I was going until school started. Nowhere, I said. I have to live here with, the new, uh, with my uncle. I didn't want to say I lived with the headmaster. Have to live here, Guthrie said. I'd give my right arm to live here all the time, all the whole year round. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, I said. And that's when Guthrie told me about the two prisoners. When I got home that day, Aunt Sandy showed me a spider plant that a neighbor had given her. It has sl slender, pale green and white leaves, 
stretching upward, and dozens of offshoots, which Aunt Sandy said were its children. The children had little roots dangling from them in the air as if they were reaching for the soil. That was me, I thought, a little plant with my roots dangling in the air. That night, I looked up kidnapped in my new dictionary. There were several choices, and I chose portare via forza, and I made a sign. Aunt Sandy said, well, I think what you've said actually means take by force, kind of like a command, as if you're asking someone to come into the house and kidnap you. Is that what you want to say? No, I did not. But neither of us could figure out how to change take by force to taken by force. So next, I tried help. But there were so many choices for that one word that I finally just aimed my pencil and stabbed one. Serva TV, I wrote. Uncle Max came in to say goodnight, and he looked at my sign and he said, well, I think what you've written means help yourself, you know, as if you're inviting the burglars in to take all of your belongings. Is that what you meant? All right, guys, I'm stopping there. This is one of my favorite stories.